Today we're going to look at this nice result regarding the density of the sine function. And in particular, we're going to show that sine evaluated at n as n ranges over all of the integers is dense in the closed interval from minus 1 to 1. So I think this is a really nice result. And maybe on the screen right now, you should be able to see an animation of sine of n as n goes from one to a thousand. And you can see it like start to fill up that interval. Okay, so now let's look at the definition of density of a set. So we say a set A is dense in the real numbers if for all real numbers x and epsilon bigger than zero, there is an A in A such that x minus a, well, absolute value of x minus a is less than epsilon. In other words, a is within epsilon of x. So for any real number, we should be able to find an element of that set that is super close to that real number. And famously, the rationals are dense in the real. So I think I've even proven that on the channel before. You should check it out if you'd like to. Although our first result along this path will quickly imply that. And I like this result because it mixes group theory and some things that you might see in analysis. So it says that if G is a subgroup of the additive group of real numbers, then G is dense in R or G has a least positive element. And this is an exclusive or, so it's impossible for both of those things to happen at the same time. So let's start by assuming that G does not have a least positive element and we'll show that it is dense in R. So let's suppose G does not have a least positive element. And then let's take an arbitrary real number X and then an epsilon bigger than zero. Then since G does not have a least positive element, we should be able to find an element of G that is smaller than epsilon. So let's do that. So let's find what I'll call a little g in G such that little g is bigger than zero yet less than epsilon. And again, that's only possible because G does not have a least positive element. Okay, and so next up, we wanna think about the string of integer multiples of G. So I'll write it like this. So we've got zero right in the middle, and then we have G, and then we have 2G, and then we have 3G, and that's gonna continue on and on and on. And then to the left of zero, we'll have minus G, and then we'll have minus 2G, and then we'll have minus 3G, and that continues on and on and on. So in other words, we've got this string, which is essentially partitioning all of the real numbers. So that means that this x, which is a real number, is gonna lie between two of these integer multiples of pi. In fact, there's an off chance that it could be equal to one of them. Okay, so let's put that carefully into words. So that means we have some integer n such that, so we'll have ng is less than or equal to x, which is strictly less than n plus one times g. So we do have the possibility that x is a multiple of g, but we'll save that for the left-hand endpoint. So let's say we're given an x. Well, that means it has to be between g and 2g, 2g and 3g, 3g and 4g, so on and so forth, in that direction or back in this direction. And that's what we've written down here carefully. Okay, now let's take this inequality and subtract n times g from all parts of it. And that's gonna tell us that zero is less than or equal to x, minus n times g, which is in turn less than g. Oh, but g was less than epsilon. But now since this is non-negative, this quickly implies that the absolute value of x minus ng is less than epsilon. But let's see what we've got here. This x was our arbitrary real number. So let's write that. And then since G is an element of G, N times G is also an element of G. So we found an element of G that is super duper close to our arbitrary element of the real numbers. But that's exactly what we needed to do to show that G was dense in R. So let's finish that off here. So G is dense 
in R. Okay, so to, con to summarize, we showed that if G does not have a least positive element, then it must be dense in R. Okay, so now let's show that if it has a least positive element, it is not dense. Okay, so that's actually a little bit quicker. So let's take little g in g. So I'm reusing my little g. Just let's recall that below this line, we're in the case that g has a least positive element. So we're taking that least positive element. So the least positive element of g. But now I think we can sketch this out with a picture and it's kind of good enough. So let's put our real number line here. Recall that G is a subgroup of the real number, so G lives on the real number line. Let's put maybe zero over here. Let's put G here. And recall that that G is the least positive element of G. That means anything between zero and little g does not contain an element of the subgroup. Okay, but that's problematic because now we can go over here to g over two and put a little epsilon bubble around g over two, perhaps of radius g over four, and we see that we come up with exactly the condition for g to not be dense in R. Okay, so we finished the proof of this first lemma. Now let's move on to a second lemma. Now we're gonna use that last lemma to prove this result that is particularly useful for our final goal. And let's start off by noticing that this thing that I'm calling G, which is everything of the form A plus two B times pi, where A and B are integers, is definitely a subgroup of R. So I think that's pretty easy to check. And what we'll do is show that it's also dense in R. Okay, so let's do that. And we'll do this by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, suppose G is not dense in R. Okay, but then by our first lemma, it has a least positive element. So let's take that least positive element and we'll call that least positive element little g in g. And we know the form of little g given the fact that g is defined like this. And so we'll say g is equal to maybe m plus 2n times pi. Okay, so that's the least positive e So that's the least positive element of g. Okay, now we're going to make a little subclaim inside of this proof. And that is that our group g is in fact cyclic and generated by little g. Okay. So let's see how that might go. So we're gonna do this proof within a proof by way of contradiction as well. So by way of contradiction, suppose not. But what does that mean? Well, that means we should be able to find something inside of G, but outside of the cyclic group generated by G. So maybe I'll call that X. So there exists an X, which is in the group G, but outside of the cyclic subgroup. But now we can fit that x between two integer multiples of little g. I think that's pretty clear just by the way that we could order the elements of group g. So let's write down that. So there exists an integer k such that x is bigger than k times g, but less than k plus one times g. And notice we do not have equality here because having equality here would mean that we were inside of that cyclic subgroup. Okay, but let's note that we can subtract k times g from all parts here, and we get zero is less than x minus k times g, which is less than g. But let's note that x minus k times g is an element of g. That's because it's just a combination of elements of g. Oh, but it's smaller than the least positive element of G. But that contradicts this minimality condition on our little G. So that means that in fact, G is a cyclic group generated by G. Okay, so now where do we go from there? Well, let's also notice 
that the integers is a subgroup of G. And that's because we could just take B to be equal to zero and we've got a copy of the integers in there. So let's write that down. So we've got Z is a subgroup of G. We wanna use the fact that a particular integer is in there, the integer one. So that means one is an element of G, which let's recall that was cyclic and generated by little g. Oh, but that means that there exists another integer D such that one is equal to D times G. But let's unravel what G is. Notice that G is M plus two N pi. So here we have M D plus two N D pi. But now I think you can see where the problem is about to arise. We have one is equal to this combination of integers and the number pi. But notice that we can easily solve this for pi and what do we get? Well, we get one minus M times D over two times N D. But that's in fact a rational number. So we've shown that pi is a rational number, but it's super well known that pi is irrational. So that brings us to our contradiction. Contradicting the fact that G is not dense in R, which means that G is in fact dense in R. Okay, so now let's see how we can use that to prove our main result. Now we're ready for our main result. That is that we're gonna prove the set sign n as n ranges over all of the integers is dense in the interval minus one to one. Okay, so let's see what we really need to do. We need to show for all y on that interval and epsilon bigger than zero, we can find an integer n such that the absolute value of y minus sine of n is less than epsilon. So that is exactly the definition over here of density. It's just now we're looking at density in a subset of R instead of the whole set. Okay, great. Okay, so let's do that. So let's say that we take y inside of the set negative one to one and some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero. So the next thing that we're gonna do is write y equals sine theta for some theta, which is a real number. And I guess here we're using the fact that the sine function is onto this interval, but I think we can use that for free. Okay, so next up, we're gonna use the continuity of the sine function. So the continuity of the sine function built in with this epsilon. Okay, so now let's find some delta bigger than zero such that if x minus theta is less than delta, then the absolute value of sine of theta minus sine of x is less than epsilon. Okay, great. And then let's maybe be careful to point out that this is possible because sine is continuous. In fact, this is exactly the precise definition of continuity right here. Okay, good. But now what we'd like to do is find an element of our set within delta of this number theta, which is possible by the density of G. Okay, so let's do that. So let's find something that I'll call, let's see, maybe n plus two k pi inside of G, such that the absolute value of n plus two k pi minus theta is less than delta. And again, just to be really careful, this is possible because G is dense in R and well, theta is a real number. Okay, so now we can essentially do our final calculation. So let's do that. So let's look at the absolute value of Y minus sine of N, where this N, well, is the N that we just took right here out of our density condition. Okay, but let's notice that this is equal to the sine of theta I'm just replacing y with sine of theta as you know, that's how we kind of define theta so that sine of theta was equal to y. So that's kind of okay. Minus sine of n plus two k pi. 
And we can replace this n with n plus 2k pi because sine is 2 pi periodic. So of course we had to use that somewhere and that's where we're using this. Oh, but check it out. Theta and n plus 2k pi are within delta of each other. But if anything is within delta of theta, when you do this sine difference, you get something less than epsilon. So we know that all of this is less than epsilon. But now starting right here and ending with this less than epsilon is, well, really exactly what we needed to prove this density condition. So there we've done it. We've proven that this set of sine values over the integers is dense in the interval negative one to one. I think this is a really nice result. And if you're still around and you haven't subscribed, maybe consider subscribing. It would really help us out. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.